Hello, and welcome to Pretend Composition Seminar. Uh, my name is Stephen Weigel, and today I'll be presenting over the language of just intonation. Um, so while I'm talking, feel free to pass around these little cards. They're just intonation flashcards, show you all your just intervals, and the colors are organized by limit. You'll know what that is by the end of the presentation. You'll also see that I have just intonation primer issues, um, which David Doty created. Uh, they were given to me by Aaron Hunt before he left for Germany. So let's talk about why we use just intonation. Here is a justly tuned major chord. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Um, and you can hear how the waves sort of lock in. You can hear really still sound. If you compare this to Pythagorean, that sounds a lot worse. And some people think that our tuning is closer to this than this. It's a little bit in between, and we'll discuss that later. Uh, just intonation really is mathematically satisfying because it uses those fractions uh, that are displayed on the cards. Uh, if you multiply, multiply a frequency by a simple frequency ratio or a simple fraction, you get um, something that sounds concordant with it. And a concordance in this case means that impression of like the sound being still. So the perfect fifth uh, sits perfectly still, the major third as well, but the just major third much more so than the equal tempered third. Uh, this works with harmonic sounds, so it's really useful in instrument making and playing. And tuning instruments. Um, Harry Parch tuned all of his instruments by ear by laying out a simple chart because he used just intonation. Just intonation is what allows you to hear something sort of snap into place. Um, so you could tune perfect fifths like this, etc. You know, um, or you could tune a major third by having it stop there. Uh, but you couldn't do that with an equal tempered major third. Equal temperament is only interval that's in tune is the octave. And of course, uh, when we use just intonation in our music, or at least when we try and lock in major chords adaptively, uh, in other words, we're using 12 to an equal temperament, but we just deviate from it to get chords that are in tune, we're only using something called five limit just intonation. So the little cards I passed around to you, you'll see that the pink colors have uh, prime numbers no higher than three in the fractions, the orange ones no higher than five, and those orange ones are sort of where we're considered to be at right now. Um, lots of people think that we should move on to the green one, which is 7, or yellow, which is 11, because it's really possible to hear consonants with these higher than intervals. Like, here's a chord that has both uh, 9 and 11 and 7 in it. And you can hear it lock into place, even though it's kind of an ambiguous thing. Or here's another one that has um, 5 and 7 and 9 in it. You can hear that that's basically just as stable as, but maybe a little bit less so, because as the prime numbers get higher, you verge on the edge of dissonance, and it's very cool how the numbers match up exactly with that idea. Um, and of course, I already mentioned that if you have instruments and you're playing using our tuning system, it's actually fairly easy to just bend the notes a little bit out of tune with equal temperament so that the notes lock into place. This is especially true with like string ensembles and barbershop. Uh, in barbershop, the singers sing in just intonation, but they're constantly adjusting to stay in pitch. And we'll discuss later why having to stay in pitch is a bigger problem in just intonation than an equal temperament. Uh, and of course, it helps us navigate the sea of infinitude that is picking pitches. It gives us this nice logical place to start. Okay, so the reasons that just intonation sounds concordant. Well, uh, when sounds with a harmonic series are used, this would be the situation I've described here. I am using a sound that has like a harpsichord with a prominent sawtooth wave. 
So that sounds really good, because those sounds contain a lot of harmonics. Um, stuff like marimbas and bells and chimes are sort of completely irrelevant to just intonation, because they have really inharmonic sounds. And then some harmonic instruments even have situations where they'll have inharmonicity, which is like a physical stretching that deviates from how the theoretical model would have us understand it. Uh, so there's that. Uh, that's why I'm using this sound so that you can hear the just intonation really clearly. Um, just intonation will also sound concordant when the frequency ratios use low numbered fractions. Uh, in fact, you can think of it very logically and see how things go from there. Because uh, if I have a frequency, you know, and I multiply it by one, I get the frequency itself, right? So that's the most consonant thing. And then next, I have two. If I multiply by two, I get an octave, or any octaves. And that's sort of universally recognized as the same note. And then after that is three, perfect fifths. Um, and then five, major and minor thirds. And uh, chains of those, chains of all of those. And then eventually we get into higher complexity. Now, there are exceptions to just intonation sounding like it locks in. Um, as is mentioned in harmonic sounds, there are lots of cultures that just don't use just intonation in their music. Basically anything um, that doesn't come from the Occidental tradition does not use anything like 12 tone equal temperament unless, you know, the European tradition has imposed upon it and like it delivered pianos and infrastructure to them and all of that stuff. Um, and I think a lot of it is dependent on mathematics. If, uh, if a culture uses math to tune their intervals, oftentimes they get just intonation. Um, and if they don't, they'll usually end up with something resembling like a seven note scale or a pentatonic scale. It's really kind of cool how consistent those patterns are without uh, any math and, you know, just kind of appearing independently. Now, if you guys learned this in school, this is the overtone series. Um, you know, we have the first octave, the second, uh, and you see how these numbers will indicate different notes. Uh, but the part that they don't tell you really is uh, how to name these things. And going back to the cards, again, it has to do with low numbered intervals. So basically, the higher the prime number that's in your fraction, um, the more uh, dissonant it will sound. So you're aiming for sounds that are closer to the unison if you're trying to get closer and closer to consonants. And uh, when we name the n limit of something, if I say five limit intervals, I'm referring to all the frequency fractions that use prime number five and lower. And then if I say seven limit, I'm referring to seven and lower, etc. Now, you'll also notice that all of the even numbers, they just create versions of octaves. And uh, there is a time and place for octave equivalency. We do assume octave equivalency most of the time when talking about just intonation, even though it can really help to not have it. Like, uh, for example, if I've got something like this chord, that really sounds better with the bottom note an octave down. I think it emphasizes the justness of the chord more, but again, uh, you know, notes that are octaves apart or just an octave, they're considered sort of the same just interval, and we'll get to that. So hopefully you guys understand how the limits go. There's also a difference between odd and prime limit, which we'll get to. Now, we have two ways to name intervals, and one of them I've talked about at length already. That's just intonation. And then the other one is by using sense. Now, measuring pitch is like measuring decibels for two reasons. It has to be logarithmic and it has to be comparative. So if I am hearing something and I hear it get louder, the way I perceive it getting louder is logarithmic in relationship to the physical thing. In other words, um, if something is getting louder, 
uh, it has to uh, increase more and more with its physical parameters exponentially as I hear it getting louder and louder in, in an additive sort of way. And uh, just intervals are exactly the same way. Uh, if you have an octave, for example, you know, that's using the frequency ratio 2. But then if I multiply that by 2 again, I have 4, and that's 2 octaves higher. I multiply that by 2 again, 3 octaves higher, and I have 8. You can see that, you know, the numbers 1, 2, 4, and 8 don't represent uh, an evenly spaced increment. Like, if an octave was 12 notes, uh, like in 12 tone equal temperament, you could just say each of those octaves has a span of 12 in between them if you're thinking about things additively. But if you're thinking about things logarithmically, you have to say, well, we multiplied it by 2 here, and multiplying by 2 there is 4, and then there is 8, etc. So, we create two simple rules here. Uh, when we are multiplying and dividing, we will use ratios. And ratios are exactly what's on the cards right now. That's what these units are called. Um, so when we're using ratios, we'll be multiplying and dividing only to sort of preserve how the physics work. But when we're adding and subtracting, we'll use cents. Um, cents are really easy. Um, if you see this piano here, you can see how all of the hertz are off a little bit. Like, you know, if I take the difference between 466 and 400 and, uh, what the heck? Sorry, 466 to 493, you can see that that distance is a lot greater than 130 to 138, essentially. But both of those are adjacent. When you're using cents, however, a half step is always the same amount of cents, 100 cents. And using cents also allows us, sadly, sort of, to divide 12 equal into 12 equal parts because there are 1,200 cents in an octave. So that it's very easy to name cent deviations from 12 equal when naming microtonal intervals. Like if I had, you know, a major second, 200 cents, 